Okay, in this video, what we're going to do is talk about what object-oriented programming is. Now, this is a bit challenging. The idea is to get across the solid understanding of what exactly it is, but to really get to that point, you need to understand a lot of things about object-oriented programming. You need to understand magical things like encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. You start pulling these things together, you start getting that clearer picture. Now, of course, we can give you the textbook description. Now, I'm just going to make one up based off of tons of different books I've seen. You know, object-oriented programming is a programming paradigm in which developers can create objects through code that mimic real-world objects, and these objects can contain state and behavior, and they can work with one another in such a way that you are able to produce a solution for a problem presented when you started developing the application. Wow. Does that sound all right, Logan? Uh, it, that sounds familiar, uh, bits and pieces. I can see where yeah, that would... Exactly. There's a bunch of bits and pieces floating around in my head because I definitely don't look at textbooks and memorize descriptions of what object-oriented programming is. Object-oriented programming is an approach for application development based around the ability to create objects. Now, when creating objects, there are three key things that you will be dealing with. You're going to be dealing with encapsulation, like I threw out a second ago. Encapsulation is the ability to have state and behavior contained. So it's all contained within an object. It can be held privately. It can be made accessible to other people outside of that object. But it's all contained. We have the ability for inheritance, the ability to define a particular blueprint from an, for an object, but do it in such a way that it's abstract, where we can then turn around and we can derive from that a more detailed description of a particular object. And we can continue doing that, and that allows some amazing flexibility in object design, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And then there's polymorphism. Wow! Now we're just throwing out really cool-sounding words. No, not really. Polymorphism is the ability for us to alter the behavior of methods. Now, you guys have seen methods a million times now. But we have the ability to modify or morph the behavior of a method from a base class to a derived class so that two different things happen. And that's really cool. Well, the moment you start putting all three of these things together, you get object-oriented programming. So you really have to have a solid understanding of those three things. So um, Logan actually has a term for what he likes to call object-oriented programming. He says it shouldn't be called object-oriented programming. What did you say it should be called? The uh, well, well, Originally, I'd... it was cascading code reuse. Cascading code. I like that. Reuse. Reuse is such an important aspect of object-oriented programming. Because as you were saying earlier, when you were talking about encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism, that's where you get into the real power of object-oriented programming. And the reason it's powerful is because of code reuse and the fact that you are still given flexibility in the reuse of that code. Exactly. So that's where I came up with cascading code reuse. As that is, you have code, you reuse it between related classes. Okay. And the code, you could say, exists at a top level and cascades down through your inheriting classes, if you exactly. will. Exactly. Now, ladies and gentlemen, at this point in time, I hope we have done an amazing job of confusing you. Because, see, right now we're kind of starting out like books do, you know, and talking about what object-oriented programming is. And they get in there and they start throwing these real fancy words at you quickly. And then they move on. Well, let's go ahead at this point and kind of downshift into 3D Buzz style of teaching. That means... We need a whiteboard. So let's go ahead and pull a whiteboard up and see if we can scribble a few things out. First of all, what is an object? So let's just start out with that because, you know, after all, it is called object-oriented programming. So an object. Question mark. All right. To have an object, we have to first have a class. So that brings up the next question. What's a class? Now, I know we have seen these things and seen these things. We've just never presented it like this before. We know that a class is a definition. It's a blueprint. Defining the way an object needs to be created. The class contains a whole bunch of members. These members allow us to define two key elements 
of an object. And that is state and behavior. How about just B-E-H? All right, so there, behavior, okay? Well, what does that mean? Well, let's think of something I can use. I'm looking around the office right now, and my mouse happens to be about a foot and a half away from me. So I have a mouse. Obviously, for this fine mouse that was created by ooh, Logitech, they've got to have a blueprint somewhere to create this. Right, Logan? Right, because they don't want to reinvent the mouse at the beginning begin with a block of plastic or whatever they chisel a mouse out of every single time and spend oh i don't know a week per mouse making one you got instead it. they want a blueprint so they can hand the blueprint to a factory and have the factory make them a few hundred thousand that's right now let's say what what type of properties would it have it's going to have let's say it's size let's say color could have weight weight they're always trying to make them smaller and lighter, aren't they? Or things that are more important, like accuracy. Um, buttons. Okay, yeah, number of buttons. All right, now some, let's go ahead and give it some, some functionality. So It we'll, can move, it can click. So, ooh, click, I like click. It can so, scroll. It's click. A scroll mouse. Scroll, and we'll just leave it with that. So here we have come in and we have defined a series of items that will basically maintain data. They're going to hold data. And then we have click and scroll. So now we've got some behavior. Okay, so state and behavior. State is us going in there and setting our fields, our data members. That's these guys right here. These are fields. Setting these guys to particular values. Okay, that determines our state for that object at any given time. So if I was to take this mouse and say, let's derive or instantiate this class into an actual object. Woohoo! So now we have a mouse. Um, <laughs> all right, no laughing. And it's got some buttons on it, and it's got a little wheel, and, and yeah. <laughs> and a little cable that runs off. So now we have an actual object that exists, and it does have a size, so its size might currently be set to something like, I don't know, three inches. Its color, I've got one of those cool black ones. You know, another thing for state, because that's a wireless mouse and has a battery, mm -hmm. battery, like, okay, battery charge could be part of its state, because mm -hmm. that's the very, very important state of that mouse is, is it charged? That's very true. Is it in a charged state or discharged state? Because that's going to be very important when we try to use it. Man, why don't you go adding stuff when I just barely have room to put anything else in here? So, bat charge. But I see it and I like it because it does help push the idea of state even more. So now let's go ahead and set that, that our bat charge is currently at. As a matter of fact, we can look at the state of our mouse right now, and, ooh, I probably should charge that up soon, shouldn't I? Yeah, it's, it's at one bar. It's at low. So it's at one bar. That is its state. And so its weight, well, at the moment it's collected a whole bunch of gunk from on the desk, so it's a little heavier than normal, so its weight is 10 pounds. I'm telling you, you should clean up the lead residue I'm, off the desk. I'm telling you. Um, and the buttons, you know, it happens to have two buttons. Anyways, you get the ideas. These things right here determine the current state of this instantiated class, this object, all right? Now, it also has behavior built into it. I can click one of these buttons, and by clicking that button, I am causing some behavior to take place. It's going to go click, click. It makes that nice little noise. It sends some information into the computer, letting it know that a button's been pushed, what button's been pushed. I'm trying to simplify this like crazy, okay? I've got a wheel that I can scroll back and forth. And as I scrub the wheel, again, information, there's behavior that's going on. Uh, the wheel's physically turning. All of this good stuff happens. Anything you want to add to that, Logan? Right. It also depends on how you look at it and almost the programming um, paradigm you're following. If you're in a WinForms app, we looked briefly at events, and you could look at all of that as behavior. 
Cause, True. Because here's the thing that came up with the mouse. It's like state and behavior get a little bit fuzzy. If you're in Windows and you wait for a click event to occur, that's behavior. The mouse is sending a click event. No, I don't. Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. And ladies and gentlemen, at this point, you get to hear when Logan and I get involved with our object-oriented discussions, they get fun. And the way we like to present our courses here are just very open and relaxed. Okay, Logan, it's time for me to beat the heck out of you. Just kidding. No, I, if, I you know, I, I do see the, the I see where you're coming from. Here's the other thing. There's, there's another side to that. It depends on what you're programming in. In X and A, you more commonly get all of these things that you would normally get as events. You get as state. As a matter of fact, in X and A, you get the state of the mouse, and that's how you figure out what buttons are pressed and where the mouse is. I have another one for you. I'll throw in charge indicator. Or pull charge. Or, or, or pull charge or anything. IND. That's good enough. Charge indicator. So this is going to, the behavior of this is always to keep us informed of the state. So now, here we are inside the object with behavior that's working with the current state of the object. Anything you want to add to that? Right, and, but it is a, a function, something it does, isn't it? It, it could does. show steady, it could show flashing. That's right. It could increase or decrease. That's right. I mean, the bottom line, I still go back to click and scroll. Man, when you click on that button, some sort of behavior is going to have to take place to let, well, the computer know that you've clicked on the button. Wouldn't you agree? Right. Uh, once you click, a, uh, a sound is produced just because of the physical aspects of the mouse. An impulse is sent because of the electrical aspects of the mouse. Now you're talking my language. Exactly. So, again, the idea is to try to demonstrate here state and behavior. All right, and I, I can let's do another one. Person. Ugh, every book out there does human, right? <sighs> so let us do human too. But let's see if we can make it more interesting in just a second. So we start out with just a general person. And then a person can break down into different categories. Let's say, let's say we decide to break them up by profession. How's that? Does that work for you? It sounds fine. So if we were to break things up by profession, then we could have, like, let's say an artist. 3D Buzz does a lot of artist-type stuff. So an artist. And let's say another example would be uh, a cowboy. Because every guy wanted to be a cowboy when they were young. Okay? Here we are with a slightly more complex version of the mouse where we've started out with a very basic blueprint of a person and every person has things such as weight just like we had with the mouse i'll put size just like with the mouse it has a different meaning and let's say with um uh the weight size all right now let's give them some functionality we all have the ability to walk and eat. Wow, there's not much we can do, eh? So here we are. This, again, now please keep in mind, I am drawing a class. So what is this? Blueprint. Hopefully you said blueprint. That's right. It is a definition of a person. But now, see, it, it's not like I can talk about object-oriented programming for more than five minutes without having to start throwing in inheritance. It, it just it pops right up from person. Let's just pretend for a moment that I did not inherit down here to artist and cowboy. Let's just pretend they're not there for a second. I could derive a person from the blueprints and, wow, oh, cool, I've got a cloning plant now or something, and actually create a human being or a person. And then with this person, I could set their state by saying, you weigh 250 pounds, you're a pretty buff dude, and your size is, well, equal to buff, and you know how to walk automatically, and you know how to eat automatically. Fair, Logan? Yeah, that's fair. So now you can truly see state, because I could turn back around. One of the things for state could be gender, if we wanted to do that, right? So now we could set it to male, or we could set it to female. I could turn back around and drive another person, and this time around would set its gender to female, and its weight to 100 and, I don't know, it's like I hear my daughters and my wife all the time mentioning target weights of around 115 pounds. 
wow. So let's throw 115 out there. And um, so now we've got a weight and size, let's say petite. Now, well, that's quite different than buff and 250 pounds. So their state is very different. Yet they know how to walk and eat too. All right. So they have their own behavior. So object-oriented program, the first thing you need to understand is that it's all about creating objects. Hey, like that, Logan. I'm going to really simplify object-oriented programming. It's all about programming with objects. And an object is simply a piece of code. Well, no, I don't even want to say a piece of code. It's not a piece of code. It's something that's currently residing in memory that has a state, and it has behavior. Is that fair enough? That is what I like to think of as an object. Now, where does an object come from? It comes from a class. So that's where it has to start. It has to start with a blueprint. Now, I can, in C Sharp, that's an object-oriented language. Every single thing in C Sharp is an object. Everything. If we were to come down here, Logan, real quick, and let's go ahead and just launch a new C Sharp, and do, do me a new console app real quick, if you don't mind. Okay. Bring up a console application, and here we go. Okay, so we can stop right there. All of our using stuff, that's right, allowing us to use a whole bunch of different namespaces so that we have access to all sorts of good stuff, and then this is the namespace that we're currently in. And wow, lo and behold, we couldn't get far at all without seeing the word class. Now, watch this. I'm going to really push the whole idea into a a really weird arena for some people. If I were to jump back over here, if we were to, let's just scroll down because we're going to hide what I'm going to draw here in just a second. What is a C-sharp program? If you think about it, a C-sharp program, I can draw it for you right here. So I'll draw this little box. C-sharp program is nothing but a whole bunch of classes. These are all classes. That's it. And there's a class over here too. That is all a C-sharp program is. Now, Inside of classes, we can derive or instantiate other classes or even that particular class we're in. So inside these classes, now we can start creating objects. So it's like this class, we're going to use you, and we're going to use you. Well, this guy over here is going to use him, and he's going to use him, and he's going to use this guy down here. And this guy over here is going to use him, and this guy uses him, and for some weird reason, this guy way back over here uses him. We've created this web between all of these classes, okay? It really is that simple. If you were to, you know, Logan, you had given an example the other day. We were talking about something else. Actually, it dealt with classes. If you're looking all the way down at, like, a grain of sand, and then we backed up a little bit, and that grain of sand's inside a sandbox, and we backed up a little bit more, we saw a, the, the playground that the sandbox was in. We backed up more, and we saw the city that the playground was in, and we backed up some more. But see how everyth everything's contained. I mean, and, and the same thing's really going here. The same thing's going on. If you get into C Sharp and your program, there's all this code being thrown away. Back away. The further you back away, you'll see, oh, my code's in a class. Back away a little bit further so you can see, what do you see? More classes. Ah, back all the way to see the namespace definitions and the, the whole thing. Whoa, every single thing is a class. There is an entry point in one of the classes where the execution begins. Now, do you want to use old 1980s procedural style? Okay, it's still being used today. But do you want to use old procedural style programming? You could stay in a single class, and you can get away with that if you wanted to. Or you could start defining other sets of blueprints, other classes, and then instantiating those and having them work together. There is an incredible amount of power in doing that, which is what we're about to uh, really hopefully start demonstrating in just a second. But Logan, was, did, this didn't make your toes curl when I pointed out that, I mean, if you really pull away, that's all it is, just a whole bunch of classes. Right. Good. You, you good with that? And the fact that, going back to the cascading code reuse, the fact that so many, like that, the middle class was being used in at least three different other classes. That's right. So that meant that that piece of code only had to be written once. That's right, absolutely. The reuse thing is just, it's huge, and that's going to become so apparent as we dig further and further into this topic. But again, backing all the way away, a C-sharp application is nothing but a whole bunch of classes. And going back to the idea of backing away from something, backing away from a set of data or a set of procedures, that brings in the whole the idea of object-oriented programming where you can look at classes 
as units. Mm -hmm. Whereas in procedural programming, you just look at a program as you have more or less or more or fewer procedures and pieces of data. Okay. And that's it. It's if a, a program is scalable, but at the same time, it becomes harder to manage as it becomes more complex. If you have a lot of procedures, you aren't afforded the ability to back away and just look at the, the program as a whole. Right. Object-oriented programming affords you the ability to back away because data and functionality can be grouped into units. You can back, you can back away to the point where you don't look at 50 methods. You look at the one class, the one unit that contains all of those methods. That's right. And in doing so, you may back away from 50 procedures, and now you're looking at one. Or if, depending on how they div had been divided up, let's say you had three classes. So you just went from 50 procedures to looking at three units. And mm -hmm. three units are a lot easier to comprehend than trying to organize in your mind 50 different procedures. And that unit is modeled to represent an object. I mean, it's... It sounds corny just throwing that in there, but it will relate to an object in the real world. For instance, when we were doing Canon and you had game item, it's not really a real world item, but I mean, we were able to visualize, oh, we had this object that has a, it has a position and a, a velocity and a texture associated to, we were able to make a mental connection of it being like a real world object, a game item. You, you look like you were going to add something else to that, Louis? Well, that, and it allows you to, Think about your code more like you would think about a real object. When you look at, let's go back to the mouse. Mm -hmm. When you look at the mouse, you rarely consider all of its functionality and state all at the same time. If you're moving it around, you may not be, you may not care about the scroll wheel at that moment. Right. And that's what object-oriented programming allows you to do. You don't have to look at everything at the same time. You can just look at the fact that your class is a class and works like a class. You can look at your mouse and just. Think of the idea of a mouse instead of the idea of a collection of buttons, scroll wheel, electronics, and so on. Exactly. Okay, so let me go ahead and jump back up here. Now, at this point, hopefully, Logan, we haven't confused everybody. I'm just we're trying to make this clear. This is really a, a large concept to swallow. So we know that in C Sharp, for object-oriented programming, what we're going to be doing is defining a class. We're then going to instantiate that class because that class is nothing more than a blueprint. We're going to turn it into an object. Now we can turn around and use that object. With the object, we are going to be encapsulating state and behavior. So there's our first use of one of the fancy words that you really do need to understand. So it's, it really is the ability to create self-contained data. It's self-contained data and it's self-contained behavior. Okay, So that, that particular object can do things on its own. And that, that affords us so much power because, like, let's go back to the game item example. You saw with Canon in Volume 1 of the XNA Extreme class, we were able to say, you know, if we were to call upon the update behavior within game item, Take care of yourself. Well, I don't want to worry. I want you to you know, worry about your own position, your own velocity, figure out where you need to be, and just do it. And that's nice for us as the programmer because now we can be coding somewhere else in our application. As a matter of fact, Logan, I can scroll back down here. We can be coding over here in this guy, and we can say, you know, we're using this guy over here. We can just simply tell that guy, you know, update something. And then, you know... He, and, he, and Exactly. And what you're getting is not care about the specifics. That's right. If we go back to the mouse for a second, you might think... You look at the mouse and you say, move. Move one inch to the left. Yep. You don't consider the fact that the laser or the LED is emitting photons or the fact that those photons bounce off of the mouse pad or that they're read by a camera or that a camera translates them into information. Precisely. All of that is irrelevant. You move the mouse an inch and you expect the mouse pointer to move an appropriate amount. Exactly. So with that word encapsulation, that we see basically it's the ability to kind of package up both data and behavior into an object. Uh, another way that I like to, to think of it is like black box technology. For any of you out there that's watching this video, and you may have been in the military or you may be some sort of electronic technician working for some firm, black box technology means that you could simply walk into a facility that you're responsible for maintaining and the high voltage power supply went out. You pull the black box out, you slide a new black box in. You're, you know it's called the high voltage power supply, but as far as what exactly goes on inside of it, that really relates to what Logan was just saying, all the intricacies in turn. You don't care. You know, it's self-contained. Everything is encapsulated within it. You just, you know, it does its thing. You just pull it out, plug it in. So I've always kind of seen um, working with objects, like working with, 
you know, black boxes in a way because you don't have to know, especially when you start working with other assemblies or code written by other people. You don't have to know how the code does things internal inside their stuff. You just need to know what behavior do they expose to me? What data do they expose me? Because they're encapsulating stuff. And then I will make use of that data in whatever way I need to, or I will call upon that behavior. I need it to do something for me. But how it does it, hey, that's its job. It's, it's black box technology. It's all built in. Does that make sense? Right, and then the fact that how what it does specifically is irrelevant to you. You that's know right. how it is supposed to work, and so you use it, and that's... It's almost like it translates the way the world works because of that object's existence. Like with the high vol- – I'm trying to think of a good example of that sure. in the real world. Something – I don't know. I, I just have to go back to the computer world because I'm, what I'm thinking of is let's say drawing in a computer can be looked at as pixels mm-hmm. at some level. You could say turning the pixels on and off in a monitor and setting their colors is a way of p- putting pictures on the screen. Right. But in a more a high, higher level object-oriented sense, you might have a model – Mm-hmm. object and that model object can be moved and rotated and scaled and while you are affecting the pixels you're doing so indirectly you're doing things like moving an object instead of drawing 500 pixels precisely now let's see I'm looking at the screen right now at this point everybody should have a general understanding that object oriented programming is the ability to define blueprints or classes and instantiate that's a fancy word a class into an object that you can then use while the program is executing. These objects contain state and behavior, and they can mingle with other objects. So that's the basics. Now, let's go ahead and wipe this out. I am, don't, hey, this right here, like I said, I, I kind of laugh at myself because a lot of the stuff that Logan and I will do when it comes to lecture time is we'll freestyle. We will just simply sit here like we're doing now and talk and discuss about this, the types of things we think you should know to have a clear understanding of what it is, as opposed to giving you a, a prepared or a, what's the word I was looking for, a, a pre-prepared um, definition or textbook style. So in this particular case, I just jumped right on inheritance, and I was getting ready to show some cool stuff. We're coming back to this. This isn't going far. All right, so let me go ahead and wipe the board right here. All right. Now, I want to spend just a second and focus on encapsulation and inheritance. So let's start mixing these two things together. So with encapsulation, it is the ability to, like we said, package all of this stuff. So let's go ahead and jot that down. So for those of you that are taking notes. All right. So encapsulation, that's one of our three big things. So that is the ability for us to... Here is a class, and we have derived from that class different objects. So we'll say this is object 1 and object 2. His data inside here is contained. It's encapsulated within that object. This guy's data is encapsulated within that object. Okay, that is a very important concept to understand. The data could be visible, so this the, the objects can see one another's data if need be. We can hide the data. There's all sorts of neat things that we can do, and we will go over all of this stuff in pretty pretty good detail as far as what we've got planned and lined up. So that's the first thing you need to understand, encapsulation. The second of the three big things that I want you to walk away from this lesson with a generic understanding of is inheritance. Now, inheritance is where the power of object-oriented programming begins to show itself. Inheritance is the ability for us to go in and to create a class. And then from that class, we can inherit other classes. Now, I'm going to do this, Logan. Even though we're not covering UML right now, I'll go ahead and throw some arrows in there. These classes down here 
are being derived from this base class. What does that mean? Well, first of all, inheritance, the quick and simple for those of you that want to write it down, is the ability for a class to inherit from another class. What does that mean? The ability to inherit members. So if I was to come up here and create a, let's say, let's go back to, I know, let's go back to person, since that's a big one. So here we are with person. And with person, let's say that we put the weight and size in person. These two classes down here could inherit, because let's say that these are public. You can control if they can or cannot inherit. And that gets, that gets in all sorts of neat discussions, which will be coming up real soon. But let's just right now, general inheritance. So it, down here, suddenly... This guy, without us going in there and defining it, defining it again, wow, actually writing code again, the same code, reinventing the wheel, it's just inherited, so it becomes available. So there's weight there, there's weight over here, and it is of type, let's say it is of type uh, integer, and size, and size over here. Okay, now these were inherited from above. Now, let's say that this person we've derived from, now, I'm going to throw gender back up here. And there's a reason I'm doing this. The reason I'm throwing gender up here is because I want to get away from person being derived into male and female, only because I see that all over the place. I don't want to do that. Instead, let's say down here, we want to, let's throw something different in there. These guys are being derived into a particular profession. I'm going to get back to the thing I started to draw it on the other one. Is that fair with you, Logan? Sure. So this that we have derived, this guy is going to be an artist. So let's just go ahead and write artist here. And this guy over here is going to be that cowboy I wrote out there. Now, obviously, the artist has weight and size, and he can, and of course, gender. It can be a male artist or a female artist. Um, and then, of course, he can do things like walk and talk. But then there's other functionality that the artist might need to know about, you know. So we could extend the class by adding new properties or new data fields or data members here. And we can add new behavior. So we get everything that we had from our base class. This is a word I just want you to really start becoming familiar with. So, again, let me and also let me add this too, just because I think this just really drives the point home. So our, fortunately, our artist knows how to walk and talk. And then over here, our cowboy also knows how to walk and talk. But, you know, our cowboy needs to know how to shoot a gun. He needs to know how to ride a horse. And our artist... Here in the year 2000, he doesn't need to know how to ride a horse and all that. Now, obviously, we could put all that functionality back up in person, but this is where, when getting into object-oriented design, things get really interesting. You really want to try to take your base classes and make them as abstract as possible so that you can inherit from those classes into many different other types of classes. So you end up with a very generic set of things in place that all other classes would need. So if there was something very particular that a cowboy needed, but nobody else at all needed, would you want to put it in person? No, you wouldn't want to put it in person because now all the other classes that inherited from person would inherit that as well. So you don't want to do that. So that means we simply extend another way of looking at it, extend person down to a new class, cowboy, and add this additional functionality in there. Okay. Logan, you want to add anything on top of what I'm saying here? Right, and organizing things into units that make sense also makes the code a lot easier to read. Not having riding a horse in person could make that class easier to read because that means that's one less method you don't have to trip over when you're worrying about how walking or talking works, how something very generic works. 
Right. That just that simply reduces the code you'd have to look at at one time and also allows you to not have redundant code in places where you wouldn't need it. Like an artist living in New York wouldn't necessarily need to know how to ride a horse. Exactly. So I, I put rope and shoot in there. <laughs> rope rope means that he knows so how lasso. to lasso. That's right. He knows how to handle the lasso and and rope a steer. Woohoo. And the artist in New York City definitely doesn't need to know how to rope a steer, so there's no reason to put the rope uh, functionality or behavior back up in person and our artists and our, what would our doctor do with the rope? <laughs> I am in the surgical operating room at this moment and I know how to lasso my scissors. No, we, we wouldn't want that functionality there. So again, guys, please keep in mind this is just a very generalized um, thing that I'm making up right now. So just the idea is to try to grasp the concept of what is going on. So, um, so that is the concept of inheritance, to be able to take a class and set it up in as abstract of a method as possible or as an abstract of a way as possible and then derive from that class. Let me see if I can give you a, a more of a real-world example. Check this out. Here's a really good example of inheritance. Let's go back to canon. Okay? So in canon, we had game items. Oh, I bet you this is ringing some bells. Logan, I am not going to draw this out in the old UML way. I'm just going to stick stuff over here to the side. We had things like position, velocity. It had a texture. It had update. And that was functionality. That was behavior. And it had draw. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, this is a real-world example. You guys did create that. And remember, when we started our coding, what did we do? After we created the game item class, our template, right, we then turned around and we instantiated objects. So let's go back up to our little picture up here. One object, and this object happened to be our player. And another that happened to be our target. And then we derived yet another one that was our projectile. So OBE3, and this was projectile. Okay, now that worked great for what we were doing with that very simple example. But what happens the moment that I want to have different kinds of enemies? I want to have rocks that just fall down like asteroids. I want to have spaceships that are clever in shooting. Or let's change this up to an adventure type game. I want to have crazy zombies that are coming after me. And I want to have, you know, some sort of soldier sergeant that's got guns and knives and stuff that can attack me. Now what am I going to do? Well, I could just continue packing functionality into this game item class... But what if we got to a point where I was also driving things like a tree? I mean, I could see how that could be a game item, can't you, Logan? Right. I mean, you'd have tree and a lot of other scenery-style objects. A boulder. Some of them might be immovable, like the tree, but or you, like you're drawing there, you could have a boulder, and that boulder could move. And that means its behavior is different than a tree, because it moves, it can be moved, whereas a tree can't. That's right. So would you really want to continue going back to your original blueprints, the original class titled Game Item, and add in, all right, here is what would happen if it needs to shoot. So here's all the functionality code for handling shoot. And if it was a boulder rolling down a hill, let's add in roll. So now here's roll. And let's see, what else? Uh, if it was a zombie, it's going to bite you. So you put in bite. Now somebody comes behind you and they're looking through your class. Or let's say they just, they're not even looking through your class. They have instantiated your class into a tree, right? And they said tree dot, okay, what can I do? Bite? This tree can bite somebody? Okay, now this is getting a little confusing. So, you know, in this particular case, you wouldn't want to go into a class and just continue. I mean, you're almost getting back into the world of procedural programming then because all you're doing is just creating a ton of methods, one after the other, and you're not breaking things up into, you know, specific related functionality, meaning that bite, bite doesn't need to be any sort of behavior available to a boulder, <laughs> to a tree, um, 
And maybe even not to your player. You may not want your player to be able to go and bite somebody, but you'd want a zombie to be able to bite the player. So let's reanalyze this, utilizing just the two things we've learned so far, encapsulation and inheritance. Well, inheritance, let's pretend we're revisiting canon. All right, so now let's restructure it. I could come in here and say, with game item from that, I want to derive an enemy. All right, so with enemy, what kind of functionality would go into enemy? Is that where we'd throw things like, you know, bite and shoot and stab? Negative. Think about the big picture. A zombie would be different than a soldier, without a doubt, because the zombie can bite you and the soldier can shoot you. The zombie does not need to know how to use a gun because he's just, that's all he does, okay? So... What we need to do is derive even further. So we're going to extend enemy into two more derived classes. So if we were to come down here, we could now create a zombie enemy. And over here, we could create a soldier. Now, let's think about these two enemies. What type of behavior would we want them to share? That is why we have enemy before they appear. Well, how about we want every enemy at any time to be able to locate a player? Because right now we have not gone into any sort of intermediate to advanced level AI. So the way we're doing everything is simply saying, hey, hey, where is our player right now? And then we don't care about anything else. We know where he's at. Well, we'd want the zombie to be able to find out where a player is at. We'd want the soldier to be able to find out where a player is at. So we could come up here and have locate player. All right, it makes sense that zombie and soldier would want to locate a player. How about they have health? Now, let's again, we're... we're, we're we're really mingling two different topics together right now, which is object-oriented programming and object-oriented design, which is something different. So we get a tie. They're, they're closely related, but they are different. And right now we're actually discussing object-oriented design. Why does health go in enemy? Why doesn't it go up in game item? Because, you know, well, it could be. No, no, no. Stop right there. Does the boulder have health? No. Does the tree have health? No. We're going to throw some shrubs in there. We're going to throw whatever else. So we don't have to put health up there. Then you could come back and argue, well, the player has health. Okay, well, check this out. Then how about we don't call enemy enemy, and instead we call it pawn. So now through our design principles we're starting to slowly formulate here or put down, we wouldn't want to have an enemy. We'd want to have a pawn because all pawns would have health. Ah, so if we were to redesign this now, you don't mind that I'm going off in this crazy of a direction. Really, you could have pawn and enemy because you'd want health and pawn, but the player doesn't need to locate itself because it's controlled by the, the human's input. It doesn't need a locate player. It is the player. It That's can right. just look at its location if it wants to locate the player. That means you still need an enemy because you still want enemies to be able to locate the player. Or you could do it another way. You could come down to pawn. I would prefer doing it this way. And you could branch off to an enemy and to a player. And the reason I personally like this. Now, man, the world of object-oriented programming is so subjective. You do, right. That's just how it goes. Even with that, you could still divide up the health uh, the same because pawn would have health, player would inherit health. That's right. But only enemy would have Fine player. It, precisely. It, and that's why I would do it this way. Because I bet you, these. the bottom line is your enemy and players are two things searching around to kill one another. Oh, well, it sounds like they have some things in common, right? Um, but then, of course, enemies got a whole bunch of different stuff, and players going to end up having different stuff. But there's things that they will end up sharing. So I personally would just simply say, all right, from game item, let's pull down to a pawn, and from pawn, let's pull down to enemy and player, and we'll start separating behaviors and fields, okay, so the state in which each of these things can hold. So I just wanted to draw that real quick, but let's, let's jump back up, bink, 
and continue on with this little example. So I just wanted to show you how we could have, in the design phase, go, oh, well, you know, mm, players pretty closely related, and change the design up. But what if this suddenly wasn't a playable game? What if this was a uh, a end of world simulator? And you Sweet. don't have just any... enemies kill each other, right? And this is just a uh, a terrarium of zombies and soldiers. Ah, meaning we can look at it like this. Fantastic. Okay, so now what kind of? So we're starting to kind of get an idea of how inside of enemy. <clears throat> I am putting, excuse me, I'm putting things like locate player, health. Um, how about attack? That's generic. All the idea of the enemy is that it's on the offense and that it's going to attack something. That's right. Now, let's say we get down to zombie and soldier, and this is where you may think, wait a minute. Now, the zombie can attack and the soldier can attack, but their attacks are different. Dun, 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 dun. We have now brought ourselves into a position where we can introduce... The third pillar, if you will, of object-oriented programming that I need you to have a basic concept of, and that is polymorphism. So let's see, where can we write? We're going to squeeze this up at the top just because there's some more space up there. I just happen to be left-handed and writing with this Wacom tablet right over those buttons is always so uncomfortable, and it results in me doing that little hump thing every time. Polymorphism. What is that? It is the ability, the ability to change the behavior from one method to another in an inherited class. All right, that, that, that's probably going to just blow your mind. What, what do you mean? Okay, so let me see. I have a definition over here. The ability to alter the behavior of a method that was inherited from the base class. There you go. So there's your definition I just read off. I, I do better when I just draw and explain from the heart. So let's go from the heart. We have attack right now, but attack needs to basically morph into different kinds of attacks. And you know what, Logan? The only reason I'm starting to slow down, and ladies and gentlemen that's listening right now, is because I'm gonna, I want to put this discussion on hold and show polymorphism slightly different because our little example that we have all the way back over here with person and artist and cowboy will work out really nice for this. Let's pretend that every person is going to also know how to draw. So we put that functionality along with walk and talk, we put it all the way up at the base class. That means that we automatically inherit draw with our artist and over here with our cowboy. Now, this is kind of funny if you think about it. If you tell an artist, draw, what's he going to do? Well, you're going to picture him picking up a pencil and drawing you a nice little picture. But if you tell a cowboy, draw, boy, he's got that gun out and ready to go. Big difference between the two, if you think about it, wouldn't you say, Logan? Very big difference. So in this particular case, we could have defined a draw all the way back up here in person, and draw technically didn't have to do anything. Or it could have done something very generic if we wanted to. But we have the ability to more or less give it multiple meanings. That brings us back to the term polymorphism, okay? To have multiple or many, if you will, Different versions of, or many different, well, that versions works for me. Does it work for you, Logan? Right. It's, it's in that draw is something you could, you could most certainly think of any person drawing, even if they don't, if they aren't an artist. If you have, a, like a little kid could have the ability to draw. Right. Grabs a marker and starts drawing on the wall. Sure. Whereas an artist is going to draw in a much more refined state, but it's still drawing. You would, you consider a kid drawing on the wall with a marker or an artist drawing a sketch on a paper that's both drawing. That's right. But now your cowboy draws a gun. He's not going to draw you a pretty picture. And your card dealer in Las Vegas is going to draw a card that he's then going to hand over to somebody at the blackjack table. Okay? So we have these different types, these different functionalities uh, that's taken place within the behavior. This behavior, this method, is of the same name. So if I was to take draw and put just some sort of very generic draw information in there, like just drawing, like Logan said, very basic, draw something on a piece of paper. Pick because up. your cowboy might still want to be able to draw a map to, for someone that he's going to hand off to, for instance. Um, but let's just say, well, let's keep it very focused here. I don't want to get too complicated. But I can take draw, and I can down here in the inherited draw, because remember, we didn't define it here. We inherited it from the class above. But now I can 
override it. By overriding it, I can now go in there and put my own functionality, right? Right. You can change it and have it do um, the same thing as the what you inherited from the same thing as the base, something entirely different than the base, or include what the base could do and extend onto that. Exactly. So that is very powerful stuff right there. As a matter of fact, how many of you guys that are watching this right now have seen the television show Heroes? It's a great show. I absolutely love it. Wasn't a big fan of the season finale, but the rest of it, A+. In Heroes, there was a hero that his ability was to paint the future. So here's a case where we can really start to mix inheritance, encapsulation, polymorphism, all of them together. We started out with a simple person. Okay? Simple person. We then inherited from that person into an artist. So this artist now has the ability to walk and talk, and he has his weight and his size. Now he has all these artistic behaviors built in, just being able to look and identify color relationships and all this other crazy stuff. Now if I want it to, I need a superhero. So I can inherit from this a superhero, as we shall call it, S.H., Isaac, that was his name. So this is Isaac. So we have inherited, this, again, this is just a class, though. We have not actually instantiated Isaac from this class. But, so here we are with this class. Now I can inherit, I, I will inherit draw again. So draw came from all the way up here at the very top. It then was available down here within artist. And now we have it again. And what Logan was saying just a second ago, which made me think of this, is he said we have the ability to override and just put our own functionality in there or put our own functionality and, and use the functionality of the guy above us. So here, let's say I want to draw to function very much like the artist's draw, but with a little bit of extra ability, like to see the future. So now his draw happens to be see the future and paint it. Okay, so that's what, you know, I'm summarizing. So that's how you would draw. extend it then. You would extend draw, you would add in the, the ability to see the future, but then you would turn around and use the standards artist drawing ability to, in, or to render that future onto canvas. That's right. So that's polymorphism. It is the ability for us to take and change the way behavior works in a derived class basically changing the behavior of a method that was derived from a parent or base class, changing it to do something that fits our needs, such as attack could exist down here with zombie. So we have attack. One second. Because we inherited that. We inherited everything. This zombie has health, or excuse me, attack, it has health properties and behavior, it has uh, the ability to locate the player, it has the ability to draw itself, it has update, it has uh, a texture that it can hold, it knows how fast it's going, and it knows where it's at, because it has inherited all of that stuff. That's the beauty here. But now this attack, it needs to work a bit differently. So we can override this attack so that it can work with some other things, such as some bite functionality. It's a zombie. It needs to be able to beat you. So it can beat you as well. So it needs those things. The soldier, of course, is also going to inherit attack. And we're going to change around its routines. And in that attack, because inside attack, we may say, depending on certain conditions and my health and this and, and I have a gun that has bullets in it, let's shoot. So we could come in here and with this guy, we could put shoot. Stab. Kick. He's a soldier. He doesn't bite. So he doesn't need to know about that. that if, if, if his commanding officer saw him biting someone else, he'd probably shoot him. Because, well, in the, in where he comes from, the regiment he comes from, respect. You don't bite your enemies. You kick or stab them or shoot them. Wow, this is becoming a violent lesson quickly. Okay, so anyways, but check this out. This, if we were to come back up to a game item and come over here and derive a new class from it, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go back to Boulder real quick, Logan, even though th this is really high level and we'd have to think it out and plan at lower level and all that. Um, I'm just going to throw it at this level. 
because the boulder doesn't need to be able to locate. Let me grab my pointer here. It does not need to be able to locate a player. He doesn't need health. He doesn't need attack. We don't need those kinds of things. But the boulder does need position, velocity, texture, update, draw. And then we could go in here and we can add further pieces of information about it, further functionality. Like perhaps it has um, break up in there. And if break up happens, then what, what it could randomly spawn X number of pieces and then regenerate that number of boulders again. It just broke up and then kill its original boulder if we wanted to. So you could go in there and you could put that functionality in there. In fact, I, I am just so that you see something different here. So break up. Good stuff. Okay, so again, the whole idea here is to just get across polymorphism, inheritance, and encapsulation. That's the key thing. I mean, there is definitely a lot more to object-oriented programming. If you pick up books, you're going to find, you know, uh, you know, object-oriented programming is... I've seen some books leave encapsulation out. I think that is just an outright no-no. You don't leave that out because objects do indeed encapsulate data and functionality. Very important concept. Um, you might see interfaces thrown in there, and we're going to talk about interfaces. They become really important real quickly, especially in allowing us to take one step closer to mimicking real-world objects. But we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But anyways, polymorphism and inheritance, critical stuff. You don't want to have to go in there. If you just take a look at this one example that I've done down here with the game item and enemy and all this, picture us not using object-oriented programming, but we design this in a procedural manner. <laughs> Ouch. That's, that, that's going to get a whole lot more complicated. It's going to become a lot more convoluted as we're calling throughout methods and everywhere. Wouldn't you agree with that, Larry? Right, and we might not even be able to get to the point where we could define something like byte. We might never have a place where that would be, where that would make sense. Right. Instead, we might have if object one and object two were this close to this much damage. So you'd have things like distance and damage. You'd never have the con you could never get to the concept of byte because there would never be a structure in place that would support it. That's right. All right, so that, that is an, an overview. So once again, an, a quick review. Encapsulation. The ability for us to encapsulate or to contain, package up, however you want to look at it. It's what gives data. you your uh, unit mentality. That's it's right. The ability to package everything up, step back from it, and look at it as a unit. That's right. Absolutely. That's encapsulation. Inheritance. The ability for us to say, all right, we need an object, but let's, let's work our way backwards. We know we need an enemy, but this enemy, it could be beneficial if, or we need a zombie. It'd be beneficial if there was an enemy class, because in our game, we're probably going to want more than one enemy type. Okay, well, it would be beneficial. Enemy needs things like, where is he at in the world, and what texture is he using? Well, he could inherit from game item, because we can move that stuff back there. It allows us to basically apply abstraction to the models that we're trying to create. So game item, this is, this is very abstract right here. We wouldn't go in there and create a game item object with what we're setting up right here, okay? Because it would be something with position, texture, velocity, update, and draw. But let's just stipulate that the way that these things are set up right now, it is intended for us to handle update in these other routines, okay? Because the enemy AI is going to be different from all of these guys. So update is up here. But it's left empty. Ooh, that might sound really odd. But the nice thing is, update is now available for everybody. So Boulder has the ability to update while it's rolling down the hill. We can, through polymorphism, go in there and override update, even though it's empty, and make it, you know, utilize whatever kind of functionality we want it to do for calculating its bouncing and rolling down a hill. Okay, where with enemy, its update might consist of calling upon the locate player and let's seek them out and figure out how we're going to attack and stuff like that. But by having update all the way back up in here, let's say later on we have to, for some reason, go and add something to update for everybody. How convenient. We put it right here. Everybody just has it. Everybody can just do it if you make sure to call upon the base's update, which we'll get into inheritance and how all of that stuff works later. But this is, again... Just a very general idea. So um, that's it. Encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Anything you want to add to this, Logan? I'm not done. I'm going to give them one more real-world example before we bring it to a close. But any more 
thing. I mean, this is a bunch of scribbly, scrabbly stuff. I, th- I think we've covered er- everything in in multiple examples. I mean, again, it's I yeah, I think everything's <laughs> been covered pretty well so far. Okay, so let us go ahead and since we've got so much going on here, instead of just deleting off the whiteboard, perhaps we should have done this in the last video as well, or not last video, but in this video in the last section. Let's go ahead and just add a new sheet of paper in here and hide this one, and. Just in case we still have people out there that are confused, and hopefully as we progress further and further into the whole object-oriented programming lessons, and Section 2, Section 3, so on and so forth, the picture will become more and more clear. But at this point, I'm hoping most everybody has a clear picture. But let's apply this to the real world once again. NVIDIA, the makers of graphics. Wait a minute. Graphics? That's, that's an odd thing to say. Graphics cards. No, that's still an odd thing to say because when I buy a graphics card, I'll buy it from, you know, EVG or E yeah, EVGA or from, you know, whoever, right? I'm not buying it from Nvidia. Now it has an Nvidia chipset. I've heard that term thrown around on the internet, but I haven't seen Nvidia selling graphics cards. Well, check this out. So here's a problem that you've just stumbled on because you don't really understand how it works. Well, let's I'm sure everybody does, but let's just stipulate you that you don't. Let's define this problem with object-oriented programming from a very high level, okay? So let's go ahead and start off in NVIDIA and take a look at a mock-up of how things might work. So NVIDIA. NVIDIA is going to start out, and they're going to have just very abstract card. All right. How abstract? Well, every single graphics card is going to have a connector. And let's stipulate that we're finally to the day and age where we're completely away from analog. Everything's finally digital. We've got to that day, Logan. Aren't you happy? We're pretending, of course. So all graphics cards are going to have a DVI connector. All graphics cards are going to have a PCI Express slot, um, the mail-in. Okay, the key saw. What the heck do you want to call that? It's the PCI, PCI Express connector. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so we have that, right? So a bunch of little bitty things down here and all that. All right, good enough. Now, we've got a place on here for us to come in and plug in a core chipset, if you will, or the core of the graphics card itself. We're not going to plug it in there. But that means over here at NVIDIA, we need to develop a core. And we're going to do that. We've been doing that for many years, in case you didn't know. And right now, we've got the G80 core. So this is our G80 core. It's rocking. Powerful stuff. I know I have one. All right, so now, what do we do? Well, the card that we've just thrown in front of you, very abstract, isn't it, Logan? I can't take that card and plug it into my computer and get any sort of behavior out of it whatsoever because it's missing a whole lot of pieces. Right. At this point, you're not really saying it's much more than a piece of plastic with a DV or a PCI Express connector and a DVI connector That's and a right. place for it to plug a core in. You got it. So now from this, though, I shall be deriving things like an 8500. So now we're going to, in essence, make cards, reference cards, okay, for other companies. Make more sense in just a second. So let's come down here. For those of you that are familiar with this world, we got the 8500, we got the 8600, and my baby, we've got the 8800. Now, from inside here, let me do this. So we're going to come over here. Let's bring up our tools because I want to be able to play with colors. So with these cards, check this out. I'm going to more or less plug in my cores now. All right. Now, you could say the 8500 can function, 
okay, where the 8600 can function. Now, NVIDIA is not going to sell these. These are reference cards that are being created that other companies are going to go about utilizing for modeling their own graphics cards that they're going to turn around and sell. Now, let's go ahead and push this a little bit further. Now, we're not going to look at everything. We're going to keep this as simple as possible. But the 8800 comes in two different flavors. Let's just say that it comes in the GTS for the lower end and the GTX as the upper end. Now, as I'm drawing this out, I'd like for you to picture all these boxes, including all the way back up here to our abstract card. Picture each of these as individual classes, blueprints, if you will. But each time that I derive from somebody above, so GTS derives from the 8800, my GTX derives from the 8800, and then my 8800 derives back from just generic graphics card, if you want to give it a name. So they drive all the way back. So keep in mind, these are all classes. So they're blueprints. But each time I derive a new class, that class inherits everything from above. So the nifty thing is, these three classes, the 8500, the 8600, and finally the 8800, have all derived from the original graphics card, they all have DVI connectors, they all have the PCI Express connector slot, they all have a place to plug in a core. Ooh, and we took advantage of that. How cool. We plugged in a G80 core into each of these. So we now have these little cores plugged in, which gave us something fully functional. But then we went a little bit further, and we took the 8800, and we made um, a lesser version, lesser memory, um, a GTX, more memory, and then there's, of course, there's a lot more th than just that. And we've got clocking issues and all sorts of good stuff. But anyways, this is what we've done as NVIDIA. And now we're going to turn around and we're going to have companies come in here and utilize our reference models that we have available. So check this out. The company EVGA is going to come in here, and they're going to say, all right, what I want to do is I'm going to inherit from your GTX right here. So I'm inheriting from him. I know for those of you seeing the arrows pointing upwards may be very, very confusing, but this is a UML standard, and it's something that I will find some way to squeak in into a lesson a little bit later explaining how to do class diagramming utilizing the UML. But anyways, let's go ahead and continue on. So here, what we derive from... The 8800 GTX from within NVIDIA is going to be an EVGA GTX 8800. Now, we're deriving straight from there. Now, for those of you out there that are familiar with the EVGA uh, GTX 8800, you'll know that there's a couple of different flavors of it. So you may be looking at this going, well, this is right now that you've just derived just one class from GTX. Why is that? Well, Logan, didn't you say earlier they might want to go in there and rip off the heat sink and put their own heat sink on? and They might want to do some overrides, some right. changes. At the very least, they might have their own stick or their own logo. Okay. Or if we go into one of the other manufacturers, what if the manu like a manufacturer other than EVJ, like, uh, like BFG, mm -hmm. what if their trademark is that they make all of the PCB blue? That may be the first thing that they do is they swap out the, PC, the PCB for blue PCB before they go into any kind of submodel. Exactly. So the moment, let's just pretend that EVGA suddenly picks a specific color. That might be the first thing they do with their GTX is they go in and they make the PCB a specific color. Okay, so now, so now, so now we've changed color right here at this. Now we can turn around and EVGA wants to make two different models available. So that means that we can come over here and inherit from this and make available we've got the super clocked and we've got the KO ACS3 all right different features on the two but in the end what are they they are a EVGA colored GTX 8800 that was based off of NVIDIA's 8800 GTX all the way from up. So you can see how we kind of walk all the way back up the hierarchy. As a matter of fact, if I come over here and grab another color real quick, just so you can see how 
we've inherited. And this is where you really can see Logan's cascading idea. Another idea you can think about is this class is a what? The, a, the KO ACS3 is an EVGA GTX, which is a GTX, which is an 8800, which is a DVI PC Express video card. That's right. So every bit of behavior that we put in a higher level class gets inherited as we work our way down. So by the time we finally end up with our true cards at the very bottom, we have, well, we've inherited quite a bit. The nice thing is at this point, let me go ahead and change my color back real quick. Now, let's say that, you know, EVGA wants to create some new card. Uh, you know, NVIDIA could just come in here right now and say, we're going to make the 8900. I'm just making some stuff up now. So we've got the 8900 card, and we've developed this new core. And we're going to call this core the G81. Limited edition. And we can now take this core, because remember, this guy here inherits all the way back from over here. So we're going to take this core and plug it in. Da -da -da. Now our 8900 has all of our base functionality. It's, you know, it's got the DVI and the circuitry in place for the DVI, PCI Express slot. It's got a slot for the core, the whole nine yards. Now we've plugged a core object into it, so now it's sporting that. And then from this, now if we wanted to, EVGA can come in here and say, all right, let's just inherit from this guy as well. So here's EVGA jumping back up into the party once again. And they don't have to worry about everything that was done to gain access to this slightly more powerful 8000 series card. They just, NVIDIA took care of all the behind the scenes stuff. They don't care. They just said, thank you, NVIDIA, for this reference model. We appreciate it. Let's take this and soup up the memory. Well, no, let's, how about let's remove some memory. And this is our low end. So this card costs you only $500. Yay. And let's take it and put up so much memory and let's keep overclocking it until everything crashes and then let's just scale it back by one and we'll sell, sell this one to you for $1,500. All right. That's their names, the $500 and the $1,500. I mean, if they could name stuff like that, they would. But anyways, <laughs> that gives you kind of an idea. So this is a generalized real-world example of object modeling. I mean, if, if you think about it, that's what's going on here. Right, to show both inheriting from and the fact that things don't, you don't have to have it set up so that everything inherits. Certain things can reference other things, so like a video card has a core. It doesn't descend from core. A video card isn't a core. It has a core. That's right. It is a video card. That's right. And also the fact that as things descend, they aren't, unique after they descend. They inherit everything that they get from their base classes. Mm -hmm. So even no matter which, anything from the 8800 tree is an 8800 card. There is no way to make it not an 8800 card. That's right. Now, you may be wondering to yourself, why did I show you this? Well, this is how we're going to wrap all of this up here. Well, I know we gave a whole bunch of very simple examples on the whiteboard a few minutes ago before I got into this big thing, but here's what I wanted to demonstrate. Company A, Company B. And you might be thinking to yourself, I, I still don't get it. All right, let us picture everything that has taken place up here as an assembly. Okay, because remember what happens when you take your project and compile it. You compile it into an assembly, right? Uh, intermediate language code, all packaged up nice and neat. you got your metadata and all that good stuff in there, the manifest. All right, well, down here we have a completely different assembly. I just wanted to demonstrate that using this object-oriented programming, you create classes in one assembly, you create classes in another assembly, and that should be a Y, not an E. There we go. And you can, depending upon the, the way the accessibility has been set up within the classes between the assemblies, you can use classes that were set up 
in other assemblies by another company altogether. So this example right here is an excellent example of very real world company X builds certain subsystems that we need to use in our game and that we've paid for and they provide us with these libraries or they provide us with their assembly and now within our game we can derive the right kind of objects that they've made available in their classes that's within their assembly and then we can extend on them and use them etc so that i just kind of wanted to throw that out there at the right it's kind of like company a provides a foundation that's right on which other companies can build so you have the assembly company b references assembly A or company A in order to find all the things it needs to base on because it's basing very heavily on everything that NVIDIA creates. I mean, down here, this could be our executable, and this could have been a DLL. That's a really good example, too, because you can't buy video cards direct from NVIDIA. That's right. And just in the way that you can't run DLLs directly. That's right. However, if EVGA was an executable, they reference the NVIDIA DLL, but they produce a usable executable that you can run. Exactly. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to pretty much bring this discussion to a close. Again, the topic, because we've, you know, we've talked a lot now, was what is object-oriented programming? And, well, what is it? Well, it's just a, a programming paradigm, if you will. But it goes so much further. It's, it's working with objects. So you, but in understanding it, you, you really have to understand what classes are, what objects are. You have to understand what encapsulation is. You have to understand what inheritance is, and you have to understand what polymorphism is. That, in my opinion, are the base elements that you need to truly understand to have a true grasp of what object-oriented programming is. Now, obviously, in the upcoming videos, we're going to continue digging deeper and deeper into this stuff and making it more and more clear in a practical sense as we create actual applications utilizing the things that we've talked about. So with that, that is going to wrap up this video on what object-oriented programming is. Thanks a lot.